as children of God. And one thing we try to do here at Journey Church is to make sure you feel the greatest hospitality you've ever felt in your life. From the moment you pull on our parking lot to the moment you leave, to the moment that you're like, listen, it's cool, I don't need another hug or another handshake. Praise the Lord for you. (laughs) But we want you to know that when you come to Journey Church, you are special. You are important. You are valued. You are thought about. You are prepared for. It didn't catch us off guard that you showed up on a Sunday morning. Because we are all part of the family of God. We are all children of God. And we want, we want you to understand that you're welcome as you come to Journey Church. That's part of our business, is bringing people to church. Encouraging people to come be a part of something. And if we're not showing the light of the world, if we're not reflecting what John 1, 1 through 17 reflects then we're not showing the right picture of what the world needs to see coming from the church. And so we've got to get to this place where we are, we are hospitable and we're caring and we're loving one another. God makes us vessels of honor when we come to the family of God. He makes us vessels. We talked about last week being vessels. The, the, does anybody remember what the instructions are? Anybody remember? What, you can just say it. Just say it. Do what he says. Just do what he says. Just do what he says. To be a vessel used by the Lord, instructions are simple. Do as he says. Do as he says. And so, again, we are at this place where we are walking out and being doers of the word of God. And we're inviting people to come. And as you've come, some of you have come in different places. The thing I love about our church is we're called Journey Church. We are Journey Church. Pastor, why are we Journey Church? Because we are all on a journey together. Journeying after eternity with the Father in heaven. That is the end goal. That is the place that we're trying to get to. But we're all at different places in that journey. Some of us have been on this journey a long time. Some of you jumped on this journey last week. Some of you got into that journey just six months ago. But we never judge anyone at the place of their journey. We encourage one another along in our journey as we come together as we grow. So we've got to realize that the Lord has called us to be vessels, children of God, to bring people into the kingdom of God. Listen, God loved us so much that he personally came to redeem our souls from the curse of sin and Satan's dominion, control, and abuse. His greatest passion for you is to restore you to a position of authority, dominion, and blessing. We read in that scripture That the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The Word came and dwelled in flesh, and He came to a place that He created that didn't even know Him. He came to a place, His own people, that have been protected by God for generations, and they didn't even know who He was. But He he gets to this place that when it becomes a passion for Him, he, He... Again, when he asked the Father, hey, can this cup pass from me? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. His greatest dream, Pastor Jeremy still says this in his book, Let Your Heart Go Free. His greatest dream for you is himself. He realized that at some point, we as people have walked away from the greatest dream that he ever dreamt for us, and that was relationship with him. And so he came to restore that. He came to fix that. And then, as Jesus did that, he tells disciples, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. You and I possess that same calling that took those 12, as Journey Youth will say it, outcasts, took those 12 outcasts and used them to have influence on generations for 2,000 years. You realize you have that same calling on your life. Pastor, what is that that calling? He has entrusted us with the greatest message there is on the earth. I think we downplay the true power of the gospel. Like, legitimately. I believe we as believers have watered this thing down so much that we don't understand the true authority and power that the gospel has in people's lives. We're so worried about they're going to think that's crazy. They're going to turn me down. They're not going to accept me. They're not going to look at me. And we're going, hey, people are dying going to hell. 
I watched a pastor this week at a conference that I was at stand up and he read in Revelation. He says, those whose names were not in the Lamb's Book of Life were cast into the lake of fire. And I watched him as he began to weep. And he said, that's my why. That's my why. Because I don't want people's names to not be in the Lamb's Book of Life. I want them to know who Jesus is. And I'm going to do everything I can And church, I'm calling us to a place this month, these coming weeks, that that is our why. It's not about me getting everything that I need. It's about me taking as many to heaven as I possibly can. It's me understanding that if that's what Jesus came for, that's what I live for. That yes, in the midst of it, he's going to provide and take care of me and love me. But at the same time, I got to pull people into the kingdom of heaven with me. But it's got to be a passion for us. So many times we want the word to just be for us. How can I get my life to be this, 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 and this? Well, let me read the word. How about this is a weapon to help you fight the enemy, but also win the loss to Jesus? It's a multi-sided sword. It's not used one way. It's used multiple ways, but we've got to realize that there's an importance of a call on our lives that the same one he said to those 12 guys is said to Journey Church in 2024. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. So as you follow Jesus, your influence begins to grow in the kingdom of God and you begin to pull people out and we begin to see people come into the family of God. And so today I want to talk about three significant, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Benefits. Three significant benefits of being children of God. Some of them, you're going to know right off the top of your head. Others, I think we've manipulated just a little bit. Okay? Number one is this, eternal salvation. Number one is eternal salvation. When you come into the family of God, you receive salvation from your sin. That's the way into the family. It says those that believed in him, he gave them the right to be called children of God. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The word loved in this passage actually means love of choice. He chose to love us. It didn't come out of anything we ever did. For Some people love people because of what they've done for them. Man, I love you because you did this, 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 and this. No, God's saying, I love you no matter what you've done because I love you. I choose to love you. You didn't have to put anything in the While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet rebelling against him. While we were yet people that didn't even know who he was, he still came to the earth to die for us. He chose us. He chose you. This is a love that is unconquerable and undefeatable. This is a love that is unconquerable and undefeatable. And it's for those that are in the family of God. John 1.12 says, But as many, as I read earlier, has received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. You've been given authority when you embrace and believe in the power of the name of Jesus. Paul was saved from religion. Paul was saved from religion. Zacchaeus was saved out of manipulation and greed. Mary Magdalene was delivered from a pitiful existence. Peter said that they were saved from the kingdom of darkness and translated into his marvelous light to show forth the praises of the Lord. What has God saved you out of? What did he save you out of? What was your life like before Jesus? And I'm reminding you because I want you to reflect on it for a couple of reasons. Number one, The one reason is this. You have to remember you needed grace just as much as the people of the world today need grace. You need people in your life that are going to come along and share the gospel with you like somebody else came along in your life and shared the gospel with you. Thank the Lord somebody invited you to Journey Church or whatever church you were invited to when you got saved. For some of you, you were raised up under a family that taught you that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Thank God for godly parents. Thank the Lord for family members who were passionate. There are so many of you in church today because your grandma prayed you into church and would not let up. There are some of you that have no clue who's standing behind closed doors praying on your behalf and God is moving in the midst of your life. But it's because there are people that realize grace is for all of us. 
We all fall short of the glory of God. We cannot do it on our own. We cannot do it on our own. Paul explains, and for those of you in the room today that you say, you know what? I'm one of those that I'm not living my life for the Lord. Pastor, how can I tell? Number one, number one, it seems like everything you put your hand to is it, it, you're trying to fix things in your life. I've got this, 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 and this going on in my life, and I'm trying to fix, 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 fix with other things that's not the word of God. And all I'm doing is pulling myself back into it. I'm trying to fix it with substance. I'm trying to fix it with relationships. I'm trying to fix it with money. I'm trying to fix it with other people's opinions. I'm not trusting the Lord. Number two, you're not living according to the word. If the, Lord's, if the word says don't do this and you do it, that's sin in your life. That's sin in your life. We've got to begin to call sin what sin is. Jesus didn't get it wrong. We don't change what sin is because we live in 2024. What the word calls sin is sin. Everybody understand? There has to be a solid straight line on what sin is because if we vary it, it will always be changing. But if there's only one way, one truth, then the truth is him. And how do we know that? I just read John 1, 1 to you. The word became flesh. He is the word. So we look at what he's saying is not right. Guess what? It ain't right. You're not going to stand before the Lord and be like, well, you should have let me grow up in a different generation because it was acceptable in 2024. Sin is sin. Sin is sin. But we have a God that loves us and will forgive us of that. So, Pastor, how, how do I come to that? Paul says that we're saved through faith in Ephesians 2.8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Catch it. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So that completely erases, I can be a good person and go to heaven. No. You have to have Jesus, this gift that was from God, John 3, 16, in your life for you to have salvation. It's the, it's the word. Right, right. Ephesians 2, 8. Write that down so you can go back and read it because I want you to check. Yeah. I want you to make sure that I didn't make that verse up. <laughs> it's not of yourselves. It's through faith in Christ, and it is a gift from God. Thank the Lord that my salvation is not on me because I could never be good enough. <laughs> Let's be honest. I could never try hard enough. I could never succeed enough. I could never win enough people enough. It's all because of Jesus. Oh, man. You possess through a right relationship with Jesus eternal salvation. So that's one of the benefits of being in the family of God. You have salvation. You can stand before the Lord one day with confidence in your heart to know that he covered all that with the blood. That price was paid for you, and you have, a, you have an eternal life with him in heaven. You have an eternal life with the Lord in heaven, and it's a good life. Living for the Lord is good. Living for the Lord is sweet and rich and wonderful. I know a lot of times we'll talk about, man, living for the Lord is hard. It's tough. It's got battles. It does have battles. It has fights. But we hinge too much on that. To not encourage people that, man, this life is good. This life is wonderful. This life is blessed. This life continues to give me more and more and more than I could ever receive. But my life outside of him, all it ever did was take, 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 take more than I could ever give. Number two benefit, power from heaven. You have power from heaven heaven. Acts 1.8 says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Acts 4.33 says, and with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Can I tell you something? The beauty of the Holy Spirit, Peter, before the Holy Spirit, was wishy-washy. 
That brother's anger controlled him. He wanted to fight everybody. There was a lot of doubters that were disciples before the Holy Spirit. But when the Holy Spirit came upon him, Peter didn't flip-flop no more. Peter was bold and confident in the things that God had said. The doubters in the disciples did not doubt anymore. They stood with a boldness and a confidence because they received power from heaven. That word power sometimes has been described as the power of the kingdom to come at work in the world today. We are a vessel. We are a faucet for the Holy Spirit to flow through to release his power into the earth. And I'm about to read a scripture to you in just a moment. That's going to let me, I'm going to let you know you have not tapped into the power enough. You have not tapped into the power enough. But God has given us enough present power through his grace. When we're weak, he is strong. He gives it to us in his word. We are able to have revelation and make it in this life because of what his word tells us. And and it's his spirit that indwells in us. As the member of the family, you have power you've not accessed for one reason or another. Write down Ephesians 3.20. Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. Okay? Let me say that again. Now to him, the Lord, who is able to do far more than we could ever ask or think. I've got kids, and my kids' imagination is incredible. Like, when you're a kid, nothing is impossible in your brain. Like, if I put a towel around my neck at five years old, I'm Superman, and I'm jumping off the roof, and I'm going to fly. There is nothing in my mind at five years old that tells me that's not a good idea. There's no limits. I haven't learned my lesson the hard way yet. This is wonderful. Let me try it. In a five-year-old's mind, two little sticks are transformers that are saving the entire world. Our brains are incredible. Our brains are incredible. Can I say that again? Our brains are incredible. How you process information, how you do things. Your mind, when you get to the end of it, there's so much more above that that the Lord can do. To him who can do more than my mind could ever think that my mind could ever imagine, that I could ever ask above anything. I could ask for a billion gazillion things, and there's still more he could do beyond that. That's incredible to me. Anybody else think that's pretty incredible? I mean, that's that's wild to me. And the reason we can't think about that is because our brain can't go that far. It, it It hits the wall every time. And I'm like, how can he do more? I don't know. It just says it in the Word that he can. But... But I hook, line, and sinker. You know how you be fishing like this right here, wait for that fish to come bite the bait? And as soon as you feel that bite, you hook it, and now you're hooked. You ready for this? According to the power at work within you. For him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask, all that stuff I just shared with you that you were like, there's... That's incredible. That's wild. Can I tell you? He does it through the power that's at work in you. It's there. You have it. Pastor, I can't tell nobody about Jesus. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. That's why the temple veil tore, because we no longer needed a place for his presence to dwell, because we became that place. We are the dwelling place of the Spirit of God. Then you back up to Ephesians 1, and you start reading through those verses in Ephesians chapter 1. Paul tells us, let me me turn there real quick. I didn't write these down in my notes, but I'm I'm all over it. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. If you came on a Wednesday night, you already know this scripture because we talked about it. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might. Listen, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand. That same power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead is in you. It's in you. The thing that came to set us all free. 
is in you. The thing that split the Red Sea is in you. The power that made manna rain from heaven is in you. You have power from heaven, church. You have power from heaven, church. And this is why when we get up here and we go, I see a lot of this and I see a lot of this because I know the power that's in you. That's why pastors go, if you'll just do what I said, do, follow the instructions. Do what he says. Why? Because it's in you. He's not asking you to do anything he hasn't equipped you to do. He's not, in, he's not asking you to do something he didn't prepare you for. He's too good of a God to do that to you. He loves you too much to set you up to fail. He's not waiting for, he's not waiting for that. Hey, go do this. Now let me watch you fail. No, I've already put it in you to do this. But there's a difference between knowing it and knowing it. There's a difference between I got that knowledge here versus I got that knowledge here. Let me, let me give you another explanation for just a second. There's a difference between I know um, how a belt on my car works. Not really. Don't, don't believe that. <laughs> I know how to do it. Hey, Ferris, uh, there's something wrong with my car. Uh, I need you to come look at it. <laughs> I just know how to do that. But I can know that the belt goes on pulleys and has to make the car work. But I don't know how the belt goes on the car to do the pulleys because it's not this thing that I've learned and I've grown in. It's just something I have head knowledge about. But when I get into something that I've got right in here, I know it and I believe it and I walk in confidence in it. That's why Paul said in that scripture in Ephesians that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Don't you love the word, how it uses things? My heart has eyeballs. I know that's how you read it. My heart has eyeballs? What do you mean eyeballs in my heart? That's what Israel would say. But what Paul is saying is, the word tells us that all things flow from the heart. That's why it says guard your heart. For the ways of life flow from it. It's because if you don't guard it, you'll allow things to get into here that you'll begin to know and not know, and you'll begin to see it flow out in your life. The enemy's very good at getting you to know things about yourself right here. He will, he will, that's why you got to be on guard to realize when the enemy's trying to plant something here. And so he's saying, you need your heart to be enlightened to the truth that there is an immeasurable, immeasurable power, source, richness that is at work in you, not through your pastor, not through an evangelist, not through the saint at your church, through you, through you. That's why sometimes when you come to a saint in your church and they turn their head sideways at you and you're like, you don't want to listen to me no more, I've tried to tell you if you'll get it right here, you have the same power I do. That's the difference. I've learned it here versus keeping it here. You learn it here, you will walk the same walk of faith that they did. And it took them getting to that point and practicing it and working it out. Oh, it's in you. If you don't hear anything else today, I want you to hear this next point because it's a really good point. But I want you to hear me today. It's in you. It's in you. It's in all of you. It's all in you. All of you up there. All of you in the sound of my voice. You watching me on YouTube right now. It's in you too in you. And he wants to work it in you and through you. Oh, oh, how great it is that the spirit of the living God dwells in me. I don't need no temple in the middle of the wilderness. I don't need all these sacrifices to get into it. I don't have to just go one time a year. I walk in it. You walk in it. We all walk in it. Oh, Number three, a divine calling. A divine calling. So when you become a, ch a child of God, a children of God, a child of God, part of the family, you receive eternal salvation, you receive power from heaven, and you receive a divine calling. 
The problem is most Christians believe they choose their calling. And therefore they live in frustration and mediocrity. Most Christians think we choose our calling versus it was already chosen for us. Kyle, this is where I need my stuff. Matt, don't get no ideas, bro. You're trying to show me up on nothing. Y'all, this game was created by the devil himself. This is pickleball, for those that don't know. It is the most frustrating thing I've ever done in my life. It was supposed to be easy. That's not my point, though. Most of us believe we get to choose our calling, that we're going to tell God what we're going to do. The problem is, God created us and formed us with an intention. Whoever formed and created this umbrella created it with a purpose, with an intention. How silly it would be for the umbrella to go, you know what? I don't want to be used for that no more. I want to be used as a sword. Let's go fight battles with it. You're going to lose every battle because you don't have the proper equipment because you want to tell God what you're going to do. This is what it was made for. This is the purpose. This is the purpose that it was made for. To stand underneath. To be a covering from the rain. But if I want to take it and do this and make it a collecting collecting agent of water, guess what's going to happen? Number one, I'm going to get frustrated because it ain't going to hold water very well. Number two, I'm going to get drenched in rain and I'm going to be frustrated. Most of you are walking around with your purpose in the wrong area. And you're constantly getting things on you and you're frustrated by it. Throw that over there. This was created for a purpose. Thank God the Vols have figured out what that purpose is. Praise the Lord for that. (laughs) I knew it. I knew it. Y'all was waiting for it. I waited till they were good to bring this out. (laughs) It's only two games in there, both high schools. It's all right. All right. There's a purpose for this. It's to be on a football field, a gridiron, American football. It's to be thrown. It's to be handed off. It's to be carried. It's to be caught. It's to cross a line to give you points. There is purpose for it. It would be ridiculous for me to take this to the hardwood and start trying to dribble it. (laughs) Because it would be going any other direction than where I want it, back to my hand or between my legs, or through the hoop. You ever tried to shoot one of these? I have. It's miserable (laughs) and frustrating. Because you're like, hey, I'm a quarterback. Let me just throw it in there. doesn't work. But again, many of you have been created with a purpose, but I don't like football. I like basketball better. So let me take what I've got and been given, and let me try to make it work, and you're losing. You're losing because you told the one that created you with the purpose, I don't like what you made me. I need you to make me. I'm going to make myself into what I want to be. And the Lord's sitting back going, I'm literally just going to let you do that until you realize, let me get you right in the right field. The divine calling that comes on your life, we have to realize, does not come from us choosing but us obeying. You understand your calling by obeying. There are many people in the church that think their calling is this when it's really this. But they don't want to obey the Lord. They want to tell the Lord. Many people have walked away from a good thing in the Lord because they want to direct and say what they're going to do versus allowing the Lord to say, no, I need you to dig roots in and I need you to stay there. How, how crazy would it be for this football to look at the person that made it and go, I know better than you. No, you don't. I drew you up. I measured you. I tested you. I watched how your performance was going to be. And then when I 
put it all together, it's exactly what I want it to be. It's the same thing with you. I saw all your days. I formed you. I knitted you together. I placed you in your mother's womb. I saw all your days, wrote them all in a book, birthed you into the earth at the time you needed to be birthed into the earth for a purpose and a reason. Don't tell me what you're going to do. Listen to what I have for you. I don't even want to talk about this one. <laughs> Embarrass myself. I was going to hit the ball with it, but it didn't work. It wouldn't have worked. <laughs> you truly discover your calling when it's your choice to obey, not direct. Your calling from God, which is your, listen, your greatest place of fruitfulness is given to you by divine assignment and must be discovered. It requires a spiritual discovery through seeking God and his will with all of your heart. I want to pause for a second. I love the fact that our feisty crew had the reignite conference this week. I, I, I love the, the, I heard about Pastor Jack's word about Joshua did more in the second half of his life than he did in the early part of his life. And I think a lot of times we in America hear, I'm retiring. I'm going to retire. There is no retirement in, in the kingdom of heaven. Moses died on the mountain, y'all. <laughs> like he died on the mountain. He, he went up, and, and Elijah was taken away by a chariot of fire. Like, nobody goes, you know what, Lord? I'm 65 years old. It's time for me to dip. I put in my season. When it comes to the divine calling of the Lord, it's not about, well, this is when America tells me to retire. This is about now, what can I focus my purpose towards to do with the more time that I have now in my life? And again, that's just an encouragement because, again, as a young pastor, we want you to be involved and plugged in. We want you to give wisdom to those that come and serve with you because all the things that you've seen, the things that you've encountered, the places you've gone, I think a lot of times we as American culture try to weed out where people, well, it's just not the same world no more. There's still wisdom in life. There's still wisdom. In, marriage is still marriage. People are still people. Y'all, I, I use this one all the time, but Second Kings is crazy. The king's riding along the wall. This lady's calling. There's a famine. And she's like, yo, help, king. And he's like, what happened? And she said, um, we were hungry. This lady came over to my house, said, let's, let's, let's cook our children and eat them. It says it in the Bible. Just quoting scripture to you. Y'all are like, ugh. Some weird stuff in our world right now, guys. But let's do it. She goes, okay. So we did mine first. And then when we woke up the next day, she had let hers run away. The lady had no intention of doing anything to her kid. She was just getting over on her. People are still people since the beginning of time. So again, when you hear wisdom from someone or someone comes in there and you've asked for wisdom, ask for wisdom. Hey, somebody that's been married a long time, I need to talk to you. I need, I, need some, I need some growth and some understanding. But again, we can't direct God and say, you know what, Lord? I'm, 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 I'm done. I'm finished. We all have purpose till the end of it. As long as there's breath in my lungs, I have purpose. As long as there's breath in my lungs, I still have purpose. And I have a divine calling. And that is where fruitfulness will be given to you. It's a great place of fruitfulness. It requires spiritual discovery through seeking God. You discover your calling and then make sure you ask God where and when. Two very often overlooked secrets to spiritual achievement. We think because God says it now, it has to happen now. Yeah. Joseph had to wait many years in prison before his word from the Lord came to fruition. David got anointed king. He would have been killed had he ran to the palace and said, I'm the new king. He just went right back to what God was telling him to do at that time because he said, where and when? And God said, not yet. I'll let you know when. Overlooked, overlooked. Once you've discovered your calling, it's incredibly easy to clarify your goals. Your place of happiness is right here in the middle of your biblical assignment. It reminds me of Psalms chapter number one. Psalms chapter number one. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. 
He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that it, the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Blessed is the man who walks not in these counsels, but trusts in the Lord, delights in his word, and meditates on it day and night. When you find your kingdom purpose, when you find that thing in your life, you are like a tree planted by streams of water. What does that mean? That means there is forever a source to feed your growth. You will always see fruitfulness in your life. You will always see fruitfulness in your life. The word blessed can also be translated to happy. Blessed actually covers both material satisfaction and emotional happiness. In English, the word happiness is emotion based on circumstance, but in Hebrew, the word happiness is based on standing with God. English has twisted it to where it's an emotional response, but where Hebrew, the Hebrew word happiness means the right standing with God. So when I stand with the Lord, that is when I am blessed, when I am happy, because I'm in the middle of what he's called me to do. So from the scriptures, there's three don'ts. Number one, don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Who are they? They are morally wrong and actively bad. That's who the ungodly are. They're morally wrong and actively bad. Do not stand in the path of sinners. They are ones who rebel towards God. These are people who apply the advice of the ungodly. And number three, don't sit in the seat of the scornful. Those who mouth off, mocking in their spirit the things of God. Don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Stand in the path of sinners. Sit in the seat of the scornful. So many of us want to go to the people of the world to talk about the calling of God on our lives or the things that God's telling us. You know, you, can I tell you something? Marriage was made by God. So why would I seek counsel from the ungodly on marriage? That's a practical point. Don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly with your marriage. Walk in the counsel of the Lord. Delight. Here's the two do's. Delight in the law. Desire the word as valuable. And then number two, meditate. Day and night. To mutter the word over and over to yourself. Speak the word over yourself. Say it over yourself. Today I'm delighting in the way of the Lord and in the word of the Lord because I want to be a tree that is planted by streams of water so that I will continually produce fruit and my, my leaf will not wither. Speak the word over yourself. Faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. Hearing comes by the word of God. These are three benefits, three benefits of being in the family of God. Some of you, you're, you, are, you are experiencing all three benefits currently. You have eternal life. You have power from heaven. Maybe we're not tapped into it as much as we could be. And then number three, you have a divine calling. And some of you are right in the middle of it. Right in the middle of it. But then there are some of you that need salvation. Some of you need salvation from the Lord. Some of you, you've been saved, but you haven't realized the power that you have. And in that, you haven't discovered your divine calling. And then for some of you, you have one and two, but number three, you want to direct, not let God direct you. A lot of times we're directed on our own preferences, what I prefer, but can I tell you, sometimes God calls us to things we don't prefer. Because it's not about us, it's about him. It's not about me, it's about him. So Lord, let me get out of the way. And you tell me what you want me to do for you. So if it's a football, I'm going to be a football. If it's an umbrella, I'm going to be an umbrella. I want to be what you've created me to be. One of the easiest divine callings I can tell you is a, praise and worship, a person who prays and worships the Lord. 
And the reason I know that is as Jesus was coming in, they were declaring the good things of the Lord, and people told him, you need to rebuke them and tell them to be quiet. And he said, if I do that, these rocks will cry out. There's two things. Number one, he would not rebuke him because he knew they were created for that purpose. We were created to declare the good things of the Lord and to worship the Lord. But he also knew in that time, it didn't matter what anybody tried to do, this moment was set from the beginning of the days and that the Lord, that God was going to see it come through fruition. But we were created to worship and praise and declare the good things of the Lord. So that's your first divine calling. Just become a person of praise and worship first and then begin to watch your life be transformed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. While your head is bowed and your eyes are closed, uh, I, I, I did not mention this point yet, but I want to. Uh, I wanted to bring up these cards. Um, we're handing you a very easy tool to invite somebody to church. It's just a little card on your way out. You'll get two of them. I want to challenge you this week. I want to challenge you to give these cards, two of them, to complete strangers. Someone you do not know. Don't invite somebody you know. I want to challenge you. And pastor's going to do the same thing. I'm going to go find two random people, and I'm going to invite them to Journey Church next Sunday to come with me. So I want to challenge you to do the same thing, to take the card and give it to a complete stranger and just say, I'd love to invite you to Journey Church. It's real easy. It's not hard. But I want to challenge you to do that, and I'll have another challenge each week for you in that. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, in the room there are some people that came, and you have been lost. You have been lost. You're not living your life for the Lord. And as we talk about light coming into the darkness, your heart and your spirit stirred and said, I need to give my life to Jesus today. I need to give my life to the Lord. Because we talked about the only way to heaven is through the Son. And there's so much more to our relationship with Jesus than just going to heaven. But there's a beautiful thing in that relationship that Jesus paid for the price. And so if you came and you say, you know what, Pastor, I'm one of those people. I need to get my life right with the Lord today. I need to ask him to forgive me of the sin in my life, come into my heart and forgive me. If that's you on the count of three, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand for a moment. One, two, three. Anybody in the room today? Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right. If everybody in the room will stand with me for just a moment.